Hi guys, so you're joining me today on the, on the banks of a beautiful freestone river in the north of England. Uh, it's sort of early in the summer and we're actually getting into the, into the time of year where the fishing is slowing down a little bit during the day. Uh, the conditions aren't ideal either to be honest, managed to pick another good day. We've got really bright blistering overhead sun and we've got a really quite nasty strong upstream wind. Um, what I'm going to do is fish through this little section of water. There's an odd fly kicking around, but I've not really seen much of a hatch to speak of. The reason I'm going to start in here is this is a riffle. Now riffles are really the, the food production engines of a river. And anything that is hatching is typically going to start to hatch off in this kind of area. So what you'll often find is that the fish move into these kind of areas before a hatch actually starts, expecting to see some food coming down in the current. The river's also very low. So this kind of area of riffly broken water also gives the fish a degree of cover, good oxygen content and some comfortable conditions to sit waiting for food to be brought to them on the conveyor belt of the current. Now as far as approach goes I've got two rods set up. The first one is a long nymphing rod, it's the Gray's wing, it's 10 foot 6 inches long for a three weight line. Those longer rods are ideal when it comes to fishing these very thin long European style nymphing leaders where we want the extra length of the rod to hold as much of that line as possible off the water and give us good long range control. The only other things on the, on the setup I'm using is the reel is a full cage reel. Now you don't want to be using these very very thin leaders with a half cage reel because they have a tendency for the line to slip out and get stuck in behind the spool. So a reel like this which has got a full cage is ideal. Another little trick which comes from the competition fishing I do is I always attach some kind of bungee band or her band or something to the back of the reel frame which I then hook around the butt of the rod and that stops these thin leaders from getting tangled around the reel foot when you're fishing. So again it's just a nice little way you can be more efficient when you're out on the water. The second rod I'm using this is actually uh, the wing 9 foot 8 slash 10 foot 8 rod. This is the one that you can actually change the length of. I'm actually using it in, if you like, the dry fly configuration, which is 9 foot 8 inches long. It's a 2 3 weight. Um, I've got that set up with a 3 weight fly line, a weight forward, a long tapered leader, and a long thin level tippet. And I might hopefully get to use that later on if we see some fish rising. So on my 10 foot 6 3 weight nymphing rod, uh, the leader setup's really quite straightforward. It's 0.16 diameter level coloured nylon. And that is about one and a half times the rod length, one and a quarter times the rod length. And then the remainder of it is tippet material to take me out to a total length of about two times rod length. Now, the only reason that the leader is set up like that, I fish a lot of competitions, under Phipps Moose rules that we fish to, your leader length can't exceed double the rod length. That's the only reason the leader is set at that length. That is the longest leader I'm allowed to use in a, in a competition. It also happens to be a leader length that I like to use anyway when I'm pleasure fishing. Um, and the leader is dead straightforward. It's all level, no taper, because with these kind of techniques, taper is weight and it's also sag. And what we're looking for with these kind of nymphing uh, techniques and strategies is to be in very, very good straight line contact to the nymph. Good contact, good control. Those are the watchwords of good contact or European style nymphing. And a long, thin level leader is what gives you that added control and contact. They are more difficult to cast. That's the only downside. But with practice, they are really, really deadly. So in terms of flies, I'm going to fish with a couple of the Perdigon patterns that I've done and also a couple of the uh, soft tackle pheasant tail style flies, things like the Dark Knight, that's a good little pattern. Nothing too specific, there's nothing specific hatching. A lot of the times fish are uh, trash feeders in all honesty, so whatever's coming down in the drift, in the invertebrate drift in the river, they will eat. Um, so you don't really need to get too accurate with your fly imitations. If we'd come here and there was a great big hatch of blue-winged olives or something similar, I may fish a nymph that was much more suited size and coloration wise to what I'm expecting the fish to be eating. But in conditions like this, when I'm just prospecting, 
I'm not too picky about the fly choice. The presentation and the approach is going to be a lot more important. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk down the edge of the river here uh, and come downstream a little bit, wade out into the sort of centre of the river, just off that, that main flow line, and I'm going to fish my way back upstream. The river's really low and we haven't got great conditions. We've got very bright overhead sun, no cover, and we've got quite a strong upstream breeze as well, which is going to cause me a few control issues with the, with the nymphing setup. But we're going to have a walk down, we're going to get in, and we're going to see what happens. So we'll go down the edge, staying quite a long way back from where I'm expecting the fish to be out in this kind of in this kind of centre area here. And the reason I've picked this is because we've got a relatively light hatch of fly, um, and I'm hoping that there's going to be a little bit more of a hatch a little bit later on. And quite often the fish will move up into these areas in readiness for food. You know, this is the real sort of food production area in a river. And anything that's going to be coming down is going to be hatching off out of these riffly areas. So it's always a good starting point, particularly when that water temperature's up and the fish are actively looking for food. I'm going to work my way out here nice and steady. It's a relatively small area I've got to play with. Carrying two rods. I'm going to start with the thin European nymphing line with a couple of nymphs, small perdigons, and I'm going to ship the dry fly rod in my belt out the way. I'm just going to start working upstream. And some of the things you'll see me do are really driven from competition fishing. And the reason for that is because they're very, very effective. The rod I'm using, it's a 10 and a half foot three weight, a little bit longer for these sort of nymphing styles, so that I can hold more line off the water, get more control and fish at greater range. You'll also notice I keep a lot of back end control of the line, so the line's always trapped under my rod finger and my left hand is always on the fly line, particularly when I'm fishing with nymphs at range. It's a mistake a lot of people make. They don't have good back end line control. I'm just working out into the river, I'm getting a feel for the depth of the run and how much weight I potentially need on the flies to get a nice drift. I might be a little bit light, so I may drop those flies down a little bit by going up in fly weight. I'm just working my way out, watching that leader really closely all the time for signs of a take. Again, when I watch a lot of people fish with nymphs, one of the big mistakes I see is that they don't strike enough you only detect a tiny percentage of the takes that you actually get when you're nymph fishing. So a good adage is to always find a reason to strike. Every single drift you should be looking for a movement or something that makes you set that hook. And sometimes it can be literally nothing more than it just not looking quite right. Ah, now that's the bottom. We don't want that. Now what I don't really want to do is, is blow this little bit of water that I've got. So I'm going to walk around a little bit and try and free that from upstream. There we go. Swing it in. I've lost that point fly. So what I'm going to do is quickly retie. Put a new point fly on. Now, rather strangely you might think, what I'm actually going to do is put a heavier point fly on. The reason is, although I got snagged there, the fly wasn't really finding enough, enough depth for me as I was fishing upstream. So I'm going to quickly drop on another fly. I've gone up to a 3.3mm bead. Again a perdigant. The reason I'm using a perdigant is in these low water conditions when the water's nice and clear, Perdigons often are a lot more size appropriate than a heavily dressed fly um, that's got a lot of body materials and dubbing, etc. The stuff the fish are eating at the minute aren't particularly big, so I'm, I'm just basically giving them something which is much more in keeping with what they're expecting to eat. I'm 
We're sort of coming into the area now where I would half expect to be getting a fish. We've got these sort of two tongs of current coming together, like two big conveyor belts, which basically are bringing the food to the fish down the river. So they're going to hang out in them areas looking for stuff coming down. There's a little fish, there's a trout, I think. Just about where we expected. So, just a little chap. I'll have him. Cool me hand. Slip the hook out of him, took that slightly heavier bead and back he goes. Now, hopefully, we'll find a slightly bigger resident. One of the slight issues here is that wind is pushing upstream and it's it's taking a lot of my contact away. Um, so I'm having to to battle everything getting blown upstream rather than concentrating on getting a really good drift. Again, let that drift down into there. Take a step upstream. And back in we go. I'm really searching around in here, that was a take then, just off a little fish. Very stab it. And I'm really looking in all the kind of likely areas. Trying to manage that drift, get the fly down into the into the areas where one may be hiding in this bright sun, tucked up against some structure or Something like that. And I can see on the bottom an odd dark shape of a of a bigger rock or an obstruction. A lot of people when they when they're looking at water, they're quite good at looking, but they're not very good at seeing. Um, and what I mean by that is you should always be trying to look through the water and see what lies beneath. And we're looking for structure and weed beds and obstructions. Anywhere where a fish might hang around with a bit of cover, waiting for an easy meal to come past him. And there we go. There's a slightly better fish. Oh, and he's come off. Typical. I'm putting that down to the camera. Hook points are still good. Let's go back in again. Hopefully, there's a few more there. There we go. Straight in the same place better fish again. What I'm going to do is, this is a slightly better fish, I'm going to drop back downstream a little bit. What I'm doing, I'm taking him away from where hopefully all his friends are, so it doesn't tip them off, and I'm keeping him upstream of me in the water. A lot of fish get lost by people trying to bring them back up current, um, rather than keeping below them. It's not a big fish, but worth catching. There we go, this little brown. Feel me hand. Flies already out because it's barbless and back he goes. Great, so take a step back up to where we were. Let's get those flies back in and see if we've got another customer. Interesting that the fish that we've had there have both been in the heavier flow volume side of the current. So basically, the area where there's more water and potentially more food going through than this area on the left. It's also the deeper side, more cover, and it's sitting in the shade slightly as well. Just seen a fish rise over there. Maybe a sign of things to come later. Ooh, that could have been a fish really is difficult when the upstream wind really does take your contact away quite badly. It, it's blowing the line upstream all the time, which is really not what you want. You can counteract it by going up a little bit in bead weight, but obviously that comes at the sacrifice of some of the quality of your drift. Now I'm, I'm putting multiple casts into this same bit of water for a reason. There's anglers we typically think that when we throw our fly into the water, 
and it drifts through a particular section, we tend to think in our heads, oh, well, that's drifted through there now. There's nothing there. I've not caught it. In reality, if you put 10 casts through the same bit of water, it very, very rarely drifts out in the same way. Usually, it'll take a different path each time because the water is not consistent in flow. Your cast never goes exactly in the same place all the time and loads of other different reasons. So when you're looking for fish, there we go, there's another one. You've really got to sometimes put multiple casts in likely areas. Here he comes, just a little chap again. And again, if I'd have taken a normal progression through this pool like a lot of fishermen do quite quickly, I would have probably left that little chap behind. And that really is one of the lessons that I heard learned from many years of competition fishing. Let's get this little tangle out that we've got. There we go, we're good. So, move back up. Take a step or two up. Back in it goes. Ooh, could have been one. I'm hopeful for a slightly better fish in here somewhere. We'll work across that far seam there a little bit. Around these obstructions that stole me fly earlier. I don't go too far, I am going to throw one into the shallow left hand, uh, right hand side just to make sure we're not leaving anything behind. Again, another good old adage you'll often hear is don't cast, don't wade where you haven't cast. So basically, what that means is don't move through water until you've actually put a fly there. And that's a little bit too thin, in all honesty. So we'll go back over to the good side. Really getting into the sort of head of it now. What I am going to do is I'm going to keep pushing up even into the shallow fast stuff because there's a good chance that the fish, because of this low water and these conditions that we've got currently, will have pushed right into the fast stuff. It is unusually low the river for this time of year and it's been quite hot. So quite often you will find those fish in these areas. That's pinged on the bottom there, so again, same drill as before, I'm, I'm not going to try and damage what's left of me good little bit of water. So just move around till I get that back. Be surprised, I mean that looks like I'm pulling on that quite hard. That is 0.10 millimetre fluorocarb and that is thin line. Um, but with that lightweight 10 and a half foot three weight, in this case it's the Gray's wing which is one of the new nymphing rods and put quite a lot of pressure on it without breaking it. One of the issues I see with a lot of people doing this kind of fishing with these thin nymphing leaders, particularly when they get into thin water, is they fish way too close to themselves. Um, you really want to be using it to its fullest advantage and reaching out and fishing well upstream away from yourself, if you can and if you can control it well and be accurate with it because it allows you to stay back off the fish there we go so that one's in shallow water that's only 12 inches of water little chap there back he goes no need to touch him now as we come up in here I'm seeing a little deeper depression towards that tree and that is hopefully going to be the money shot here and that's where there might be a slightly better fish 
typically, as I'm getting near the trees, the wind's getting up, making it more and more difficult to get good control. In we go. Ooh, no, bottom. Same drill, I'm going to come upstream a little bit. And get him off, I think we may have lost that one. Yeah, that one's gone. Never mind. No. This is interesting, so I've just cracked off there now. I've gone down to one fly, and it's the one, it's actually broke at the dropper. Because that water is shallower, what I'm going to do is something that a lot of anglers get wrong when they fish in shallow water. There's actually not no quite enough depth in there for me to keep good contact to two flies. So I'm just going to go to a single nymph. So we just lost that fly and I've taken the opportunity to, to go down to a much shorter tippet. This is now only about three feet in length with a single nymph. As I mentioned, the reason for that is something that a lot of people get often get wrong when they're coming into shallow water or water indeed with a lot of structure. Um, when you fish two flies in water like this, it can actually be really difficult to properly search it thoroughly enough. Because you've got two flies landing, they're often going in different speeds of current, and you've not got good contact to either. So particularly when the fish get quite picky, you'll miss a lot of fish and you'll, you'll bump a lot of fish. So having that shorter tippet and having it closer to your indication will often result in slightly better contact slightly more takes and slightly more fish hooked and landed hopefully so i'm just going to work up into this bit in here it also makes it slightly easier to control everything around all these trees and obstructions that single nymph lets me get much more accurately to the fish there's a little spot over there near that rock which i like the look of just in there let's see give him another one in case he's there. Right, we'll just push up into the shallow stuff now, see if we can get that bonus fish, which we're hoping's in there. There he is, a little bit better, nice positive take and we've got a little bit of water left where we might squeak another one out, so we'll slip that one back, still not really the stamp of fish we're looking for, I'll be honest, we're, we're hopefully trying to find those bigger fish that are here, Barbara's hook's got a good hold, we'll just slip that out. Back he goes. None the worse for his experience. And we've got about six or seven yards of water left. There we go, there's another one. Oh, just a little chat. I think it's fair to say. If I'd have continued to fish with those two flies in here, I would probably have just had bumps off those fish, just caused by the poorer contact. Because that is very skinny in there. We're also getting in now to the undergrowth, so I'm going to slow down a little bit. And cast that wind's picking up as usual. And try and get that fly right in under that tree. Despite the wind. Move around a little bit. Try and improve my angle to where I'm going. Mm. 
Coming to it now, last couple of casts really. Come on. No. That one couldn't have gone in any further. Last cast, and I think we've about done that. No, what we will do before we go out, we'll do a little bit of pushing the limits. And by that, I mean I'm going to shorten that line up. Bring out a competition trick, which we sometimes use. I'm going to kneel down. I'm going to shuffle in. And I'm going to try and sneak one out from all of this garbage. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to catapult cast this right in to the tricky stuff. And that's going way further back than I could hope to get in with a normal cast. This is one of the reasons why a lot of the flies you see me tie and a lot of the flies I do for Fulling Mill are very simple. The reason is I don't want to ever be in a position like that where I'm scared of losing a fly at the, at the chance of not catching a fish. So what we'll do, we'll recover that and we'll call that a day for him there I think. <laughs> 